Okay, uh, good morning everybody, and uh, I wish you a very warm welcome here to Trinity College, uh, Dublin, as Director of the Institute for International Integration Studies here at Trinity College. We're delighted to be the host site uh, for this uh, Eurostat um, seminar and the launch of this report on global value chains. I'm going to uh, start my presentation this morning with a question, uh, a question um, coming from an extract from a report that appeared in the Washington Post newspaper back in the early part of the last decade. The extract goes as follows. An American worker running Oracle's database software with Windows from Microsoft Corporation on a Dell computer with a Pentium 4 microprocessor from Intel Corporation, who takes Prozac in the morning from Eli Lilly and Viagra from Pfizer at night could have received all those products from here, Ireland. 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 Uh, I, I present this because I think it's uh, quite instructive in terms of, first of all, uh, demonstrating very vividly the disjunction between market size and production size in terms of, the, of our global economy today. It's also instructive when we look at this extract from the perspective of today. And we can observe from the perspective of today that, for example, Dell computers are no longer being assembled here in Ireland. They migrated to Poland some years ago. Pentium 4 microprocessors are no longer being produced by Intel because Intel has superseded these processors with more advanced generation processors. Prozac and Viagra, which went off patent, Prozac in the early part of the last decade, are not being produced in the same volumes as they were back then. So uh, what we see is flux. We see a shuffling, shifting, and change. Um, and indeed, if the same uh, journalists were to write the same report on Ireland today, there would be many more elements included there. If I might mention one, 99% of all uh, Botox produced in the world is produced here in Ireland and exported throughout the world. Um, so, thinking in terms of globalization, then, and drawing on the perspective of Thomas Friedman, a dynamic phenomenon, as we just observed in, in the case of uh, production sites in Ireland, inexorable integration of markets, nation states, and uh, technologies, enabling individuals, companies, and nations to reach around the world farther, faster, deeper, and cheaper. And globalization is enacted then via the flows of materials, information, knowledge, finance, and peoples across borders. And international integration represents the ongoing outcome of that process of globalization. In terms of the enablers of globalization, the opening, deregulating, and privatization of economies that we've seen over the past three decades, advances in information and communication technologies, particularly the advent of the internet, the World Wide Web, advances in transportation systems in terms of their greater robustness, versatility, and of course, uh, cost, um, giving rise to new modes of organizing, outsourcing, offshoring, inshoring, uh, insourcing, uh, supply chaining, and informing and communicating for free, and with ensuing complexity fueled by interdependencies and blurring of boundaries, particularly the boundaries of the firm. So the essential issue then that arises in this world today, which is so interconnected and, and integrated, is that we've never been so interdependent. And yet our knowledge and understanding and data uh, of this world, this interdependent world, are based on models and insights that reflect a very different reality. For example, we still tend to base much of our analysis on thinking on the obsolete and ultimately in the context of an interdependent world, the destructive notion of self-interest, which can lead to disagreement, conflict, and even war. When such interdependency that exists in the world today calls for models and systems that are based on mutuality. This is not a novel insight. We can go back to Keynes' general theory, where he remarks the mercantilists were under no illusions as to the nationalistic character of their policies and their tendency to promote war. So if I could borrow the subtitle of the um, head of the WTO who spoke here in Dublin yesterday, A World in Search of a Compass, the subtitle of his talk uh, was uh, A World in Search of a New Compass. So in a sense, we're looking for a new conceptual model and we're looking for data uh, that really reflects the reality of our world today. Um, so there's an urgent need then for researchers to develop new paradigms, new understandings that can address in the varying ways the challenges of inter interdependency arising from international models. And interestingly, Davos 2012 had as its theme 
the great transformation shaping new models. And Klaus Schwab, the founder of Davos and the ongoing director, uh, remarked that at the opening of uh, Davos 2012, we desperately need new models. And one area of particular interest to myself in which uh, scholars have raised the issue of new models uh, uh, relates to foreign direct investment. We've seen a dramatic change in foreign direct investment in the last decade or so, with the advent of multinational enterprises emerging from the developing emerging economies, and investment by these companies flowing into the advanced developed world. Traditionally, when we look at uh, FDI, North, north flows, north south flows, uh, quite, quite familiar, quite common, quite conventional. In the last decades of, of the 20th century, we saw south south flows with enemies from uh, developing emerging countries investing in adjacent similar economies. But then over the last decade, we've seen this uh, emergence of growth in FDI from the south into the north. And outward bound FDI from emerging developing economies have been growing at a greater pace than. FDI from developed economies in recent years. So I remarked then that there's a data deficit characterized by a lack of reliable and consistent data in terms of the emergence of southern multinationals and their impact on Europe that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And indeed, if we are to develop models uh, that speak to the particular characteristics, firm characteristics, institutional and governance characteristics of these firms, then we need new models to, to describe and understand those characteristics. So since we're about global value chains today, uh, global value chains in my perspective, from my perspective, represent the enactment of globalization. Globalization at its heart is about flows, various flows, and global value chains are the basis of such flows. <coughs> and the ongoing construction, deconstruction, and reconstruction of such chains provides the infrastructure through which globalization is enacted. The design, configuration, and coordination of these chains to achieve maximum business performance is central to the role of multinational enterprise. Integrating emerging uh, technologies into such chains to create symbiosis, uh, uh, to, to create symbiotic business systems that yield maximum performance is the key to competitive advantage in today's globalized world. So what do global value chains do? They make it possible to bring together all the materials and components that combine to make a product or service to deliver it into use through distribution systems, to support users on a 24-hour basis, and to recover and integrate residue into waste streams. These chains that we'll see span the world so that even mundane items now commonly involve the coordination of flows of goods, of information, and in finance, people across several continents when navigating customs costing, security clearances, and identity verification. Global value chain today typically can involve American designers, Indian software engineers, Asian manufacturers, European system integrators, and support provisions. So here's an example then of how, uh, taken from the Wall Street Journal in 2009, Best Buy, a US uh, retailer, places an order with Toshiba in Japan for DVDs. Uh, Toshiba, in turn, uh, tells its plants for hire, factories for hire in China to crank up production. <laughs> These, these plants then place an, or, an order for chips to Zoron Corporation in California. Uh, in turn, uh, Zoron tells uh, its subcontractors it's, uh, in Taiwan, the Taiwanese Semi Manufacturing Corporation, for example, uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, to, um, uh, tells it to deliver its chips. Uh, it needs additional capacity to meet that order. It needs additional equipment. So it places an order with applied materials in Northern California to produce equipment for its manufacturing purposes. In turn, applied materials uh, contacts its service suppliers in, in the area to help it to, to produce these. Uh, so what we can see is a, sim a simple order, and this does not reflect the totality at all of the outcomes of that order, involves flows across the world in terms of materials, equipment, uh, data, uh, and ultimately finance, of course, and, and uh, payments and so forth. So global value chains then are organizational systems that operate across multiple nations that are integrated, whose global integration is complex, whose technology-based <coughs> engine is ICT, that drive firm-level uh, competitive advantage through integrating global and local competitive and comparative advantages, that build and defend long-term competitive advantages to complex and hard to imitate firm-level assets capabilities. That, it, that can evolve through many stages of development or indeed can be born global. 
that incorporate traditional or conventional activities and functions, but also involve whole system activities from sourcing to customer support, body materials, information, financial and business <laughs> and assets. But again, to illustrate the complexity of, uh, of, of these systems today, here's a case drawn from the, the recent um, horse meat saga in Europe. Um, and it has to do with uh, Fendus uh, food products that appeared on the shelves at UK supermarkets. How did those products appear on the shelf, the meat products appear on the shelves of UK supermarkets? Well, uh, there's a, a meat processing company in, in um, northern France that places an order for meat uh, with a wholesaler in southern France. That wholesaler subcontracts to a supplier in Cyprus. In turn, that subcontractor in Cyprus contract, uh, contacts a, a trader in the Netherlands. That trader locates an arbitrator in Romania. Uh, that that a Romanian uh, firm then uh, dispatches the meat uh, to southern France, which in turn sends it to uh, a site uh, of the original ordering processing company in Luxembourg, and from that site then it's sent to supermarket shelves throughout the UK and, and parts of Europe. So again, it gives a whole new meaning to the term in terms of the extensive activities that go, be, go behind the term from, from farm to fork. So again, the complexity of these chains may be seen, for example, in the activities necessary to bring a new automobile to market. Flows of various materials, ore, steel, petrochemicals, performance, plastics, glass, paint, rubber, mechanics, electrics, electronic software, upholstery, just to name some elements, must be coordinated to take the form of automobile parts, components, and subassemblies. must all converge in a just-in-time fashion to an assembly plant to be fashioned into an automobile, and then dispersed geographically through distributors, dealerships, and internet vendors into final ownership and continuing service in the hands of individuals throughout the world. Even the component network for Ford's manufacturing manufacture sites for the escort in Europe and uh, parts, components being uh, flowing into those sites from Europe and even as far away as Japan. Now, in terms then of the impact of, of the uh, propagation of production um, activity across the world uh, and the dispersion of uh, production activity across the world. Uh, UNCTAD, in its recent report on global value chains and development, reports that some 28% of cross-border trade in goods and services is overstated as a result of double or multiple counting. 80% of global trade is accounted for by value chains administered by the Indies, <coughs> such that global investment and, and trade are thoroughly entwined international production networks. <coughs> Almost half of value added input to exports are from service uh, sector activities. So these are, are very... Um, profound uh, numbers to reflect on. So thinking in terms of value, then, we talk about global value chain, but exactly uh, what do we mean by value, and, and what is the driver of value? Well, looking at it from the firm perspective, firms are about delivering value, um, and firms are about creating value, and in the creation of value, there are two components. Uh, there's a consumer surplus, uh, which is uh, the uh, elements that meets customer needs through the firm's value proposition, but then there is also that part of value that is captured by the firm, the value captured by the firm. And firms operating for the most part in the past several decades on the basis of a shareholder value maximization seek to maximize that, that value capture element of value creation. The value chain framework itself has a primary activity, secondary activities, it's a very useful framework for analysis because it takes an end-to-end -end perspective in terms of activities, resources, assets, capabilities, relationships, financial and operating data. It allows us then to, to think holistically across the whole chain of activities and from a firm perspective it enables them to identify opportunities in terms of new ideas and innovations which come from a question of what is currently uh, in the chain and how it's positioned and configured, what is not and what could be. So in terms of capturing value then, how does the firm, uh, and how is the firm been uh, seeking to capture value in recent decades? Slicing and dicing the value chain itself into specialized um, activities. Extracting value from stages, other stages of the value chain via outsourcing. Repositioning on the value chain, uh, as exemplified by the founder of Asset Computers in Taiwan, Stan Shi's smiling curve, as we'll see in a moment. 
and then collaborating and sharing with partners on the value chain to uh, establish a win-win situation for all so that there's a positive outcome, a positive sum outcome. So here's the smiling curve, which is central to our understanding, I think, of uh, the emergence of global value chains. If we look at value added, um, where are the opportunities for value capture here? They're back up the chain, or they're forward facing in the chain in, in terms of, of customers. But down here in the central part of the chain, the production, manufacturing, uh, assembly area, um, the opportunities for value capture are, are limited at best. So product firms, brand owners, OEMs, um, instead of uh, operating at, at, at in this area of the value chain, contract outs, outsource, subcontract these activities uh, to specialist uh, providers. And that process of migrating from those areas has created some huge corporations in the world today who specialize in particular activities in particular parts of the value chain. So enterprise then is um, <coughs> crucial in terms of the value chain configuration. Multinational enterprises determine the value chain configuration, the way that activities of the value chain are spatially arranged, taking account of course of a multiplicity of factors um, which, are, which are lengthy in number. So from the perspective then of global value chains and the emergence of global value chains and the accompanying fragmentation of production, uh, we operate in a globalized world, enabled by the opening, deregulating, and privatizing of economies, advances in ICT and transportation. But the driver then, um, but it, there are motivations in terms of fragmentation and, and configuration, but the driver um, is shareholder value. And, and this has been the overriding driver of firms in the last several decades, leading to the global fragmentation of production, offshoring, which could be internal within the confines of the, of the company, or external via outsourcing, which in turn could be via middlemen or contractors, and all of that then is supported by a panoply of supporting and related services, logistics services, supply chain services, and so forth. Again, to illustrate the globalization of production, uh, here's uh, a JCB digger. Back in 1979, Virtually all of the parts of that digger were emanated from within the United Kingdom, close to 100%. Fast forward to 2010, and just over a third of the parts are, uh, emanate from the UK, with the remaining parts coming from Western and Eastern Europe, Turkey, India, and elsewhere. So a very vivid uh, demonstration of the extent to which uh, production has globalized and sourcing has, has globalized as well. Of course, there, there are strong reasons consistent with, with the um, driver of uh, uh, maximization of, value, of um, shareholder value to engage in global production because you can capture um, price competitiveness, you can adapt to local markets, you can avoid trade barriers, you can avoid uh, foreign exchange losses. But as, as, as production uh, propagates and disperses it, uh, and supply chains become more diverse, it becomes difficult to transplant tacit knowledge into these overseas sites and to secure efficiency and inventory and quality control. And of course, there's also then the hazard of technology leakage and IP leakage as well. In any event, manufacturing has transformed with global fragmentation of production. I mentioned here that the uh, term made in the world has entered the discourse. Um, and then other elements that are worthy of, of note here in terms of global value chains is that current with the hollowing out of their manufacturing activities, product firms have sought to drive value creation by embracing uh, new business models that incorporate elements of servitization. Um, so services today account for a major portion of the revenues of many multinational enterprises. And we can see other elements then that are coming to play in terms of the configuration of global production. Uh, one that I'll mention is the uptake of 3D or additive manufacturing, which offers new possibilities for the configuration of manufacturing activities and customer engagement. Now, global fragmentation is not without risks, although we have seen brand owners and, and um, OEMs um, with the propagation of their, of their value chains becoming multi-tiered in nature. Uh, a good example of a multi-tiered uh, um, value chain network is that that produces the iPhone. Uh, for example, there is a chemical, a BT resin, which is produced almost exclusively in Japan, which is shipped to customers in South Korea and in Taiwan. 
that resin is used to produce the substrate uh, material for the printed circuit board. Uh, then the chip packaging companies take this substrate uh, along with chips that are supplied by the semiconductor companies to create the printed circuit boards, typically in Taiwan. And these are then shipped into China where the major uh, assembly of the iPhone takes place. And I'm only talking there about a small sector of the overall value chain network. So you can get some sense of the complexity that's involved here. But there's also risks, as I say, and some of these have been very high profile in nature. Uh, Apple recently getting very much into the spotlight with a um, uh, uh, focus on the working conditions of its major assembly supplier in China, Foxconn. And indeed, here's Foxconn, um, an illustration of the emergence of specialist producers uh, in the world responding to the fragmentation of production um, and the outsourcing of production as well. This is a company which in 2000 and in 1996 employed 10,000 people. Today it employs over a, hundred, over a million people. Its revenues are approaching $100 billion. Not only does it have its extensive footprint in East Asia, particularly in China, but today it has a footprint right across the world in North and South America as well. Fragmentation of production, the Dreamliner um, Boeing 787. Um, just to give you an example in terms of how Boeing's um, outsourcing of production has evolved over time. 15% of the 767 Boeing jet was outsourced to Japan. 21% of the 777. And the Dreamliner, 35% of the parts, components, and inputs into the assembly of the 787 Dreamliner jet from Japan. But you, you will not have been uh, keeping an eye on events in the world if you were not uh, conscious of the fact that there have been serious problems with the Dreamliner 787 in recent months. And indeed before that in terms of bringing it to, to final assembly. So the experience with the development of this particular product suggests that there are limits to the effective management of the complexity that such large-scale outsourcing entails, especially when modularity involving manufacturing and design are, are low. <laughs> and more broadly then, the globalization of production has been linked to some um, negative externalities, the erosion of the industrial commons in some sectors and some geographies, the hauling out of the middle class and the rise of inequality in the developed world, rise in unemployment, but of course for many low-cost countries it has been a tremendous benefit in terms of development. So think in terms of the smartphone. Um, Here's an interesting analysis which uh, I draw from the New York Times in, in uh, uh, 2010, but the similar analysis is in the much quoted AGB I paper that was published in December 2010. Here's what's interesting about this is that assembly accounts for only $6.54 of the overall selling price of $600 of the, of the Apple iPhone. And the estimated profit, 360. Now that does not include all uh, costs. So you could uh, reasonably assume that the profit, when you take into account uh, costs that have not been included in this analysis, is somewhere in the region of $300. So that's $300 out of the selling price of 600, which is an uh, enormous uh, value capture. And that value capture um, is reflected in, um, in Apple's huge uh, profits in, in, in recent times. Um, and of course, well, Apple's level of value capture and other companies' levels of uh, value capture is possible within the context of globalization. It's driven by the overriding embrace of the primacy of shareholder value and its maximization. Now, one final point then uh, in terms of complexity, the complexity and measurement of global value chains is, ex is, is, in, in, is exacerbated then by the fact that m and engage in administrative arbitrage in terms of tax strategies, uh, represented by transfer pricing and round trip investments. Some interesting data from a recent OECD report on addressing base resource erosion and profit shifting. Uh, Barbados, Bermuda and the British Virgin Islands make more investments into the world uh, than uh, Germany. Finally, uh, to conclude, I ask the question, are there signs of reversal in this trend? There's a possible, there have been suggestions of a possibility of a renaissance in, in developed economies and an embrace of near-shoring and reshoring has been observed in the case of a number of firms. Now, apart from cost and nimbleness consideration, another, a number of other factors are obtained here. Increasing consciousness of the vulnerabilities of globally dispersed value chains, recognition of the benefits and indeed sometimes the imperatives of the co-location of design and manufacturing functions, 
an awareness of the limits of a manuf uh, to manufacturing fragmentation, suggesting perhaps that we're close to a tipping point in terms of the global distribution of production and manufacturing activities. Apologize for having uh, exceeded my time. Um, so thank you very much.